Okay, hello. Uh, so far, there's only two people here. But, okay, hopefully everyone's out voting. Um, well, I don't know if it's worth making an announcement. <laughs> I was going to announce that, unfortunately, I'm going to have to cancel my office hour for, for tomorrow um, because of parent-teacher conferences at my kids' school. Um, I'll send out an email about that as well. If anyone needs to or wants to talk to me, um, send me an email and we can find a, a time to meet. Um, all right. So unless any of the three of you are here have some question, <laughs> I will start talking about Quine. Okay, so um, oh, Sh Sean, you might be someone who would want to hear this announcement that I'm not going to have an office hour tomorrow. Um, so uh, if you if you want to talk to me before Monday, you can send me a, oops an email, and we'll try to find a time. Um, okay, so Quine. Um, Willard Van Orman Quine, or Van, as Carnap referred to him. Uh, I guess that's what his friends called him. Anyway, um, uh, one of the probably the most influential American philosopher of, I don't know, the 50s and 60s, more or less. Um, 40s, late 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, this paper, Epistemology Naturalized, is actually um, um, somewhat late compared to the other stuff we've been reading. It was published in 1968, but um, in, in many ways it's uh, historically speaking before that Putnam piece uh, and it's uh, developing ideas that Quine already started having in the late 40s. Um, so uh, in any case, be that as, it's, as it may, um, it's uh, this is one of the um, main papers by Quine which is considered to have uh, put the nail in the coffin of logical positivism. The other probably most important one is um, Two Dogmas of Empiricism, which I sometimes teach in other classes, but I don't assign here. I think it's less relevant to the um, line of argument we're thinking about here. It's about the analytic synthetic distinction, basically. Um, this one, on the other hand, as you can, I'm sure you noticed, if you read it, gets straight at the Aufbau project and tries to explain what went wrong with it and why it was hopeless to begin with. So, um, so there's basically uh, two main things I want to talk about here. The first one is the details of Quine's argument. Yeah, I just got these new markers from uh, Amazon Basics, and they're good, actually. Hmm. I should get them to sponsor this lecture. <laughs> this is a sponsored lecture. All right. And the second is... Um, well, I won't say existential WTF like our speaker did recently, but I'll just say.
what the hell is actually going on, right? So, um, because uh, I think once I finish describing the details of Quine's argument, um, it's going to be not that hard to show, again, as in the case of Goodman's argument, that um, it's quite unfair to Carnap. That it seems to leave out Carnap's main motivation and substitute another one for it, which his project couldn't have succeeded at, um, at fulfilling. Um, so, but then again, I'm going to try to explain what the real disagreement between them is. Um, so, okay, so I'm going to start with the first one and then do the second one. Um, so, uh, this paper, obviously, as you can tell from the title, is about epistemology. And what does that mean, according to Quine? Well, it has um, two parts. And these two parts should sound familiar, both from the overall, overall organization of this course that I mentioned at the very beginning and from the Aufbau, um, and also later stuff like Carnap. So it has two parts. One is the conceptual part. And the other is the doct doctrinal part. So, um, um, I'm going to switch to the document camera and let Quine explain what these two parts are. Oops, but I didn't switch to the document here. All right. Um, well, maybe I should start. So this is in a paragraph that's talking about the epistemology of mathematics, or well, studies in the foundations of mathematics. But as he goes on in the paper, he says that the problems of epistemology are parallel to these. So there's two parts, conceptual and doctrinal. The conceptual studies are concerned with meaning, the doctrinal with truth. The conceptual studies are concerned with clarifying concepts by defining them, some in terms of others. The doctrinal studies are concerned with establishing laws by proving them, some on the basis of others. Right, so these are the same two parts of an axiomatic system that Carnap in the beginning of the Aufbau called the constructional part and the deduct the constructional system and the deductive system. The constructional system tries to um, derive concepts from other concepts by means of definition, and the uh, deductive system tries to derive statements from other statements by means of deduction. That's what Carnet. That's what Quine is calling the. Con the uh, conceptual versus the doctrinal parts of epistemology. And um, the goals of these, according to Quine, now right away it's going to be unclear whether Carnap actually agrees with this. The goals of this, according to Quine, are to transmit clarity from concept to concept and to transmit obviousness or certainty or self-evidence from statement to statement. That is, hopefully, at the foundation of the conceptual part will be um, perfectly clear and distinct concepts. 
And at the foundation of the doctrinal part will be self-evident, obvious, perfectly certain statements. And by means of definition, the clarity will get spread from those foundational concepts up to all the other concepts. And the certainty or obviousness or self-evidence will get spread from those fundamental statements up to all the other statements. Um, and one last thing, while well, I still have the document open here, which is that according to Quine, um, the relationship between the two parts is this. Um, the two ideals are linked, for if you define all the concepts by use of some favored subset of them, you thereby show how to translate all theorems into these favored terms. The clearer these terms are, the likelier it is that the truths couched in them will be obviously true or derivable from obvious truths. Right? So according to Quine, the obvious purpose of the, doc of the conceptual part, um, so again, the conceptual part is concerned with meaning and definition. And it corresponds to what Carnap called the constructive system. According to Quine, the obvious utility of that conceptual part is for the sake of the doctrinal part. And the doctrinal part has to do with truth, which is transmitted by deduction. And this corresponds to what Carnap calls the deductive system. So the idea is that what we really want out of epistemology is certainty or truth or what we at least would like to get from it is certainty. Um, and that um, the, on that basis, the project that suggests itself is to first handle this conceptual part, get everything really clear, and then it should be at least likelier that we'll be able to understand how to deduce everything from some self-evident first principles. Oh, there's a question. What's the book you've got it in? This book is called uh, Ontological Relativity and Other es Essays. It's a, it's a, oops. It's a thin book. <laughs> um, it has, yeah, it has some very other very important essays in it, such as the title essay, Ontological Relativity. Um, okay. Um, right, so um, in, right away, as I said, it's not clear whether this story is one that Carnap would possibly agree with. Um, because remember, um, Carnap says that the task of determining what's true or false falls to empirical science. So philosophy is not involved in that. Well, okay, but um, it turns out that Quine kind of agrees with that, uh, um, and it, uh, and so, in other words, that this story about what epistemology should do, settle this in order to settle this, is something that uh, would have been desirable, but actually um, is not possible, and um, and this is the point of the little history of the history of epistemology that Quine includes, which leads up to the Aufbau. And the history of epistemology begins with Hume. <laughs> so, um, uh, 
Descartes, for example, is not mentioned here. Um, it begins with Hume. And, um, and the story is that Hume wanted to do that thing, that two-part plan that, um, that Quine laid out. Um, in particular, what Hume wanted to do was to clarify the concept of body. This is Quine's Hume. Okay, <laughs> not my Hume and not Goodman's Hume either, by the way. All right, so um, what Hume wanted to do was to clarify the concept of body by translating it into statements about our ideas and impressions. Um, and, um, uh, and thereby, Hume thought, we um, might be able to attain certainty in our statements about bodies, right? So if I said, you know, there's a piece of wax on the table in front of me, and I wanted to know well, how could I be sure about that, I could translate it into statements about my ideas and impressions, and then the hope was it would be possible to... Um, infer the translation of that statement, there's some wax on the table in front of me, from self-evident, obvious statements about my own experience. So that was what Hume wanted to do according to Quine, but this is kind of the prehistory of Hume, because Hume, by the time we actually have something written by him, which is actually when he was pretty young, <laughs> um, has already realized that this will fail. And it will fail because even if one is successful, he won't be able to do part two. He won't be able to deduce these physical object statements from the statements about my ideas and impressions. And the reason is that um, general statements and future particulars, so general statements like, you know, um, um, all sugar dissolves in water, or all mac, all max, all wax melts when it's heated, um, or future particulars like the sun will rise tomorrow, or this piece of wax will um, melt when it's heated. Hume realized that even um, given a translation of them into statements about my ideas and impressions. Um, the translation would not be deducible from any obvious statements about my ideas and impressions. That is, it would not be deducible from my present or past experience. So, um, so that's the story. Hume had to give up on two, but he thought one was still... Um, possible. And then Quine tells a little, I mean, as I said, there's a whole history of epistemology between Hume and the Aufbau, but the history of epistemology is kind of weird. It has two people in it, uh, not counting Charles Sanders Peirce, who also gets mentioned. Um, the two main people are the American philosopher Alexander Brian Johnson, who, if you've never heard of him, uh, it wouldn't be surprising. I've never seen him referred to except in this one essay by Quine. <laughs> um, and the other is Jeremy Bentham, who, of course, is famous as theorist of utilitarianism, utilitarian ethics and politics but is not very famous in the history of epistemology. <laughs> um, and that's it. And then, well, okay, sorry. And then there's two more people at the end, Frege and Russell. Um, Frege, the late 19th century, and Russell, very early 20th century, people who worked in this story, um, anyway, on 
the foundations of mathematics and on epistemology. Um, so I'm gonna, if I have time at the end, I'm gonna try to say something about why those people are the history of epistemology from Hume to Carnap. Um, why, for example, Kant, Husserl, um, uh, Reed, Mill, Priestley, <laughs> uh, um, you know, I mean, without going into, for example, Hegel or Nietzsche, which you might think, although actually, uh, Carnap cites Nietzsche in the Aufbau. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, you might think that was a little bit out there, but those people I just mentioned, it's hard to think of how to give a history of 19th century epistemology without mentioning them. Um, so I'm going to try to say something about why that happened, but in any case, all Quine does with them anyway is to say, and they had some better suggestions about how to do part one. Um, and basically the better suggestion they had comes down to definition by meaning, but, uh, sorry, um, definition in use, as Carnap puts it. Right, so um, that was what they contributed to the Aufbau. Um, they gradually made it clearer or something like that, how this would work. Um, and then we get to the Aufbau, and the Aufbau is going to try to do with these tools as perfected, ultimately by Frege and Russell, to do part one properly. Whereas uh, um, Carnap already knows, as Hume, the author Hume, already knows, that part two is hopeless. Um, now, uh, so... By the way, this, again, is already something that's questionable as an interpretation of the Aufbau. Um, why? Because, remember, I mentioned this distinction between, between conceptual and doctrinal is parallel to the distinction between constructive system and deductive system that Carnap mentions at the beginning of the Aufbau. And... Um, What Carnap says about them at the beginning of the Aufbau is that what we're after is an axiomatization of uh, all of science, and it will have these two parts, a constructional system and a deductive system. But, uh, you know, because the constructional system has gotten less attention, that's what I'm going to be talking about in this book. That's the way Carnap puts it, at least in section one of the Aufbau. So it sounds like, actually, Carnap has not given up on part two, at least um, that uh, uh, surely he agrees with Hume. And by the way, did Hume discover this, that we can't predict the future from our present experience? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, um, so but surely he agrees with Hume. Well, Yeah, let me put it this way. Surely he agrees with Hume that whatever would be the case if I actually had all my experiences that were ever going to come in, according to that fiction that he introduces, um, uh, Carnap certainly agrees that on the basis of the experiences I've had so far, I can't even be certain about present statements about physical objects, like there is a table in front of me, let alone future ones or general laws. Because the constructional definitions, uh, even on the lowest levels of the system, you know, require you to do things like count up all your experiences and see if more of them are like this or more of them are like that. 
So as long as you're still alive and you're going to have more experiences, you can't, in principle, finish that task. So, uh, so that's why I'm saying even at the stage of the alphabet, Carnap already certainly agrees with Hume that this part, as Quine envisions it, is impossible. Nevertheless, he still seems to think that there's some use for it. And as we saw in, you know, the later papers, even the methodological character paper from 1956 or whatever that was, um, those two parts are still there, right? The theoretical language has axioms and deductions in it. Um, so... Again, this is, uh, this is already a hint that whatever Quine thinks um, is the purpose of epistemology, Carnap never agreed with that. All right, but in any case, um, from, if we accept Quine's story, this raises... Um, uh, let me... This raises kind of a puzzle, right? So the idea is that, you know, uh, Carnap has learned this lesson from Hume, and what he's learned from the people in between are some suggestions for doing this part more easily. But the question is, so we understood, according to Quine, why, as long as you thought part two su should succeed, why part one would be interesting, because it would make it more likely for part two to succeed. Um, but why are you still interested in part one, even when you've given up on part two? So, uh, Quine treats this as a puzzle. He treats it as a puzzle about Carnap, although, again, presumably it would already be a puzzle about Hume, according to him. Um... What then could have motivated Carnap's heroic efforts on the conceptual side of epistemology when hope of certainty on the doctrinal side was abandoned? Why do that? So, um, Quine initially, like the continuation of that paragraph I was showing you was something like, there are, there are two good reasons. So he initially gives some reasons for this. Um, basically, the reasons are like to make it clearer what our evidence is for scientific theories, um, um, to, to uh, deepen our understanding of what we're saying when we propose a scientific theory. But, um, but the main part of the paper um, raises a problem about those explanations, right? So the, so, the, so the structure of the argument is, okay, you know, we can think of some reasons why it would still be good to do this, but the question is, um, couldn't you achieve the same thing more easily, more satisfactorily, better, um, using a completely different approach? And um, the point where Quine raises that issue is on the next page, page 75. But why all this creative reconstruction, all this make-believe? So the question from Quine's point of view is, if the point of this is to explain the relationship between our actual evidence and our scientific theories, and also, apparently, again, as in Quine, as in uh, Carnap and Goodman, our kind of everyday statements about the world are also going to be included under the heading of scientific theories here, right? So all the things that we say based on our sensory stimulation, as Quine puts it, um, if if the point of this is to explain the relationship between those two, in order to 
make it clearer what evidence we have for what we say or in order to understand more clearly what we're talking about when we say these things. Um, if that's the point, why do it by means of rational reconstruction, which is explaining how fictionally we could translate um, all our scientific theories and everyday statements into statements that only mention my, my basic experiences or my sense experiences or something like that. Why do it that way when um, we could just tell the real story about the relationship between them? And the real story, as Quine agrees with Carnap, will be told by empirical science. In particular, uh, Quine assigns this to what he calls psychology. So, I mean, you know, I guess you might say it's neuropsychology or, I mean, it's, anyway, it's going to be some kind of investigation of how it is that um, we really... Um, process sensory information um, in such a way as to output these statements. Now, I mean, you know, I think he's, in a, he's imagining a situation. This only comes up kind of uh, um, by the way or in passing in a certain place. But what he's imagining, I think, is a situation where we have like a linguist or someone asking me showing me various stimulations and asking me, so would you say this? <laughs> would you say this? Would you say that? Um, so, uh, uh, well, I mean, well, sorry, I not, not necessarily like determining whether what I say depends on sensory stimulations and if so, how. And then, you know, then, you know, in collaboration with a neurologist, you know, we could look into my brain while that's happening and understand what the connection between those stimulations I'm getting and the statements I'm producing or, or assenting to is. And the, the reason you have to think that's the situation is that obviously we don't all walk around constantly saying what we see or what scientific theories we believe. Um, uh, you know, in fact, we probably produce sentences like that pretty rarely. <laughs> um, so, uh, but, uh, but that's the type of situation that Quine, I think, is hoping we can um, not reconstruct, but actually explain. So, I mean, this shows, first of all, that we've moved beyond Goodman because Goodman still claimed to be doing exactly that project of rational reconstruction that Carnap was. He even used the term rational reconstruction to describe what he was doing. So, um, so you know, that, I guess, is, aside from the chronological order, is why Quine comes after Goodman in the course. I feel like this is a more radical critique of logical positivism. Um, Goodman still thought it could be done only a little bit different. Quine is like, um, whatever could be done along those lines, there's no point to it. Okay, so, I mean, so the question then is, um, Why all this make-believe? And uh, Quine gives two answers. Um,
Sorry, I'm getting confused with the other question. Quine gives one answer, <laughs> right? That is, Quine says, well, the only plausible answer I can think of is, right? So now, again, the structure of the argument, he's going to reject this. So he's going to say, why all this make-believe? Well, uh, I can only think of one reason why you would want to use this make-believe account instead of a real psychological account. Um, actually, what am I saying? He does give two answers. It's just one of them. He dismisses so quickly, I don't want to talk about it. Now I've gotten myself. Now I'll have to talk about both. All right. So there's, there are two answers. The first one, he says, is, well, you might think... Uh, to bring in the results of empirical science here would be circular, right? The point of epistemology is to uh, provide a foundation for empirical science. We can't rely on the results of empirical science to do that. But Quine says, no, no, that would only be if we still hoped to get certainty. We still hoped the doctrinal project would work. Then that would be circular. But now, as it is, there's nothing circular about it. We're trying to clarify the relationship between these things, and we should use whatever we think we know to help clarify it, including the results of empirical science. So, um, so he dismisses that reason for make-believe, but he says um, um, there's still one reason left, which is that we're still hoping maybe to provide that translation of all the statements of science into statements about our sense data. Or in a physicalistic system, we might be hoping to provide a translation into physical statements, but he spends most of his time on the system of, according to what Carnap and Quine also calls epistemic priority. Right, so um, that is, we would like a translation, as Quine understands it, of talk about bodies, external corporeal things, into talk about experiences. And why would we like that translation? Um, so, I mean, notice we could clarify the relationship between our evidence and our statements without providing a, tr a translation like this. But Quine says the translation in itself would be useful. Um, and why would it be useful? Because, he says, it would show that the physical concepts, the body concepts, are innocent. That they're theoretically innocent, as he puts it. Theoretically innocent means um, that we don't have to believe some theory is true in order to be justified in using these concepts. Something like that. Again, if I have time at the end, I'll say more about what innocence means here. Um, but in any case, uh, this is what we would want it for. Translation, which would allow the elimination of body concept, of body talk. And by showing how it could be eliminated, it would show that it was innocent. And therefore, that it won't have to eliminate it, right? I mean, that's kind of the tricky point here. If it, as long as we're sure it could be eliminated if we needed to, then we're fine going on using it. That's the idea. Which would be lucky because, as Hume would point out, we certainly are going to go, go on using it. <laughs> we're not going to stop saying that things like, there's a piece of wax in front of me. And Quine says, um, this is something that psychology couldn't do. Psychology, in the way it will um, address this issue, will not result in instructions for translation because um, 
that clearly is not the way we actually get from our sensory input to statements about bodies. Right? That is, we don't actually form beliefs um, like, ex, you know, kind of internal statements that we say to ourselves about our own experiences only and then translate them into body language in order to emit them to someone else. Um, that stage doesn't actually happen. Um, it doesn't work that way. We don't learn language that way. Um, and therefore, when psychology looks into how we do do it, however it is, it's not going to come up with this. And that's why Quine says we might still want this make-believe. And by implication, that's why Carnap still wanted this make-believe. Otherwise, he would have been better off just studying psychology. Um... So according to Quine, this was what the Aufbau aimed at. The Aufbau aimed at showing that our language about bodies and, you know, by the way, also about all these other things like, you know, psychological statements, statements about art criticism, whatever, was innocent because it could all be translated into talk about our experiences. Um, and yet, according to Quine, it failed the Aufbau failed to perform this task. Yeah, how do we know the Aufbau failed to perform this task? Well, I mean, first of all, Quine gives a historical argument for that. Basically, he says, look, if you look, even in 1936 with testability and meaning, uh, Carnap has already given up on the project of translating the theoretical language into observation language. Right, because he's already said that we're going to have to use weaker forms of reduction than definition. Oh, sorry, I've been missing a lot of stuff in the chat. Uh, but most of it is about Watchmen, which I unfortunately don't really know much about. <laughs> so I won't have to talk about it. Um, all right. So um, I've heard of it, but I haven't read the comic or seen the... Uh, it's a TV show now, is that right? Or is it a movie? Okay, anyway, whatever it is, I don't know it. Uh, I think I read something about it in The New Yorker or something. But <laughs> all right. Um, okay, so anyway, um, um, right, so, uh, right, that is Quine already admitted and all the other logical positivists admitted even in the mid thirties, they had already all admitted that this translation project wasn't going to work. And because of the very things that uh, caused problem for the doctrinal project, like general statements and future particulars, um, that is, you know, induction, um, they also admitted that the translation project won't work. Now, I mean, that historical argument isn't that convincing maybe there is a way for it to work and they just didn't realize it. Especially, that's especially the case given that Goodman, who Quine worked with um, on a lot of things, uh, was still claiming that it could be fixed up and published this book, you know, The Structure of Appearance, trying to say how the Aufbau project could be done correctly. Um, but therefore, Quine has a stronger argument. I think he has an explanation for why it couldn't, why this translation project couldn't possibly have worked. Um, so, um, and the explanation is 
what's known as holism. Sometimes now people, you'll hear people call this Quinean holism. Um, and this is why. Uh, Quine himself doesn't take complete credit for it. He, he says it's um, Duhem's thesis. Um, so sometimes this is called the Quine Duhem thesis. I'm not going to go into who Duhem is, but anyway. Um, and the, uh, the thesis is basically this that only a theory as a whole. Not any individual sentence has a translation into statements about our sense experience. Um, and the reason is, roughly speaking, because, you know, suppose you, um, you crank up your theory and spit out some prediction and uh, compare the prediction to experience. Um, and, um, uh, well, maybe that's not the right way of putting it, but, um, and the basis of that prediction, you, f you form some kind of expectation of what experience you're going to have, um, but you don't have that experience, then, um, you can always... Yeah, actually, this isn't the right way to put it either. Right, okay. Take all the predictions that the theory makes. I should have written this out better in my notes. Suppose um, your experience seems to go against one of them. You can always fix it by, um, or almost always fix it, by adjusting some of the others. So, like, uh, for example, you know, um, if uh, your theory is Newtonian mechanics plus a certain uh, conditions about what the solar system is like, and on that basis, you predict that Halley's Comet will return in a certain year. And you look up in that year and there's no Halley's Comet. So, um, I'm still not getting this right. Yeah, I think I'm getting confused because actually I'm realizing this now. People mean two different things by this. One is that the theory doesn't predict any particular... Oh, I see. Okay, so no, here's the right... So if I... The, the problem is with theoretical statements. So a, give, a theoretical statement might be something like, um, you know all bodies attract each other with a force equal to GMM over R squared. So, um, and the question is, what particular empirical predictions do we think that statement is responsible for? So, for example, you might think that among the empirical predictions that that statement is responsible for, one is that if I look up in a certain year, I'll experience seeing Halley's Comet. So part of the translation of that theoretical sentence into experience talk would be blah, 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 and if I look up in a certain year, I see Halley's, when I look up in a certain year, I see Halley's Comet. But, in fact, by adjusting other theoretical statements, and here a theoretical statement is anything that's not just about my own experience. So, like, 
for example, one theoretical statement is that um, there isn't a lot of stuff in like uh, interplanetary space that comets will run into, smash into, and stop. <laughs> Um, you know, but, uh, if there is, then the theory doesn't predict that I'll see Halley's Comet again, right? You know, the theory predicts maybe that it will go on an elliptical orbit until it smashes into this spherical shell that's around the sun and it will stop. <laughs> so, um, I won't see it come back. So um, it wasn't part of the empirical meaning of that statement by itself that I'll see Halley's Comet again. It was part of the empirical meaning of that statement plus this other statement that there isn't a big spherical shell out there that will smash, that will stop Halley's Comet when it gets to it. And hopefully you can see how this will go, right? If I try to say, okay, so it's those two, I can, always I can always bring in another theoretical statement that I'm relying on to make the connection between those two and the empirical observation. So, um, and I can always say, no, it's that one that was false. These were true. These theoretical statements were true. That one is false. So in the end, all I'm going to be able to compare to the prediction is my total theory of what things are like. Is that clear? I'm sorry, I got kind of confused uh, explaining that to begin with. Is there a question about that? Um, Right, and Quine says you can see this happening in the Aufbau if you pay attention to the step where he introduces um, the physical things, the thing world. And you'll see that at that point he doesn't give you any instructions for translation um, to get rid of predicates like at a certain place at a certain time. All he does is give you a way of assessing a total assignment of colors and whatever to the things in the thing world in terms of the totality of my experiences. So after that step, anything you say, like there's a piece of wax on this table, any individual statement doesn't have its own empirical meaning. And if Carnap had noticed that in the Aufbau, he could have saved himself a lot of trouble because it was already clear that the project was doomed. But there's something weird about this, and this is the end of part one before I go into part two that I wrote up at the beginning. There's something weird about this. Well, uh, there's two weird things about it. The first one is um, that whatever he realized at the time of the Aufbau, as Quine points out, by the mid-30s, Carnap definitely agrees with Quine that this translation is impossible. And yet, he keeps doing, as we saw, basically a version of the Aufbau project over and over again for 20 more years at least. So according to Quine, that's because he just didn't notice that the whole thing, the whole reason he was doing this is because he wanted to be able to translate in order to show that our, our talk about bodies is innocent. He just didn't notice that um, he wasn't uh, trying to do that anymore. So he just kind of kept doing more of the same thing for no reason, <laughs> basically. No motivation was left. Um, Carnap kept doing that and Neurath and Hempel and the whole 
rest of the gang kept doing that for 20 years at least um, without noticing that the whole point of it that they already admitted that the game was up in 1936. Oh, someone just said, I think it makes sense. Can you repeat, though? My audio cut it out for a bit. Um, the part about holism, I take it, because that's where I asked if it made sense. Yeah, so again, the point is that if I have a theoretical statement, like a statement of the law of universal gravitation, it doesn't make particular empirical predictions except in conjunction with lots of other statements. So if it seems to predict that, you know, I'll see how he's common at a certain time, um, it really only predicts that in conjunction with a lot of other statements about what forces there are in the universe, what other bodies there are in the solar system, etc. And so it's really only all of those things put together that I can compare to the empirical evidence, not any statement one by one. And that's why Quine says that this translation project is is obviously well not obviously but is doomed to fail when you think about it um okay so that was one weird thing about getting back to what i was saying before one weird thing about quine's conclusion here is that it's hard to believe these people didn't notice this and the other weird thing about it is that Actually, um, a different and I think better way of interpreting what happens in that very section of the Aufbau that he's talking about is that Carnap agrees with him about this already in the Aufbau. So what is the translation of a statement like, you know, there is a red body at such and such a position going to look like, according to Carnap? Well, I think it's going to look like this. There is exactly one way of assigning, um, there is exactly one best way of assigning colors to positions in space according to the following desiderata, right? According to the, the following criteria that we would like to fulfill. There is exactly one best way. And when you assign them in that best way, you get this. So um, that will tell you how to eliminate that statement. But it will tell you how to eliminate that statement um, um, only all together with all the other statements. <laughs> uh, namely, uh, they can all be eliminated in favor of the statement that there is one best way of da 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 da. All right, I think I didn't make that as clear as, as maybe I could, but I don't have time to try to make it clearer. So in any case, I, I mean, of the, of the two things I pointed out here, the first one I think is obviously a problem. The second one is less obviously a problem, but if it's a problem, it's a bigger problem for Quine's interpretation, right? So in other words, the first one says, look, according to you, Quine, you have to say that all these people just didn't notice that they weren't doing things for any reason anymore. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, but, uh, so, I mean, to that, you could say, well, I don't know, people do stupid things sometimes, even smart people, maybe especially smart people do stupid things sometimes. <laughs> um, so, but the second one, it's less clear because it depends on trying to understand what Carnap really intends to be the translation into the logical language of that section. Um, and since Carnap himself never came back to the Aufbau project, we, it's hard to know. But um, um, but if I'm right about that, and, and Carnap himself is already agreeing with Quine and the Aufbau, then this would be an even bigger problem, because then you would have to say that uh, Quine's whole explanation for why Carnap undertook the Aufbau project couldn't be right. All right. So for both of those reasons, I want to go on to part two. I was hoping to leave more time for this, but at least it's not that bad. 
Um, and part two, as you recall, is what the hell is actually going on here? So I want to start with this. Um, according to Carnap, what is the motivation for rational reconstruction? Well, basically, there's two motives. To show the unity of science. and to exclude metaphysics. Quine doesn't mention either of these motives. <laughs> um, now, as far as the first one goes, um, Carnap already says in the Aufbau that this actually could be done using any reasonable constructional system. It doesn't have to be one that's based on epistemic priority. Um, and sure enough, we see in later stages of Carnap that this unity of science project is still continuing, um, but it's just not done by the part of the system that shows the relationship of science to experience, right? There's a whole separate theoretical language in the methodological character, and the point of it is to reduce all of science to some fundamental laws and um, uh, fundamental facts, um, and those are not laws or facts about anyone's experience. They're about electrons or something like that, right? Um, so already in the Aufbau, the reason we want a system of this form with the basis in the auto-psychological realm is because of this, because we want to eliminate metaphysics. Um, but how is that part going to work according to Carnap and the Aufbau? Well, remember, I emphasized that um, when it comes to, for example, saying what the basis should be, right? What is the auto psychological basis that we're going to choose? Carnap says, how do we know? Ask empirical psychology. Um, so epistemology is already naturalized in the alpha. <laughs> Right? I mean, yes, it's true. There's all this make-believe, rational reconstruction, or, I mean, make-believe. It's not arbitrary make-believe. It's talking about what could be done under certain idealizing assumptions. But what really could be done under those assumptions? Right? Not what I make believe can be done on those assumptions. But in any case, so there is all that make believe, so to speak. Um, but the. Um, um, but the premises that the. The problem the make-believe is going to attack is supposed to be derived from empirical psychology, not from like introspection or something. And therefore, the fundamental concepts in the system are not theoretically innocent. They're concepts of gestalt psychology. <laughs> Carnap never claims that they're self-evidently clear and distinct. He claims these are the best, the best results of empirical science suggest that this is what is immediately available to us. So what's the point of this then, right? We can ask Quine's question again, what's the point of this then? 
it can't be what Quine is saying because um, um, if it were what Quine is saying, you would have to start with theoretically innocent concepts. So what is it then? And so here I'm just going to refer to what I claimed about what the Aufbau was doing before when I talked about it. Um, and basically the idea is to, that first of all, we recognize that science is this responsible project. We're taking that as a standard for ourselves. We want to learn how to speak responsibly. Um, and um, um, the test for whether we can do that is whether we can um, take the results of science and show based on them uh, step by step why science has a right to say all the things it does. That's a test for our system because we begin with the idea that science has a right to say the things that it does. <laughs> and and the, the test of whether um, we're learning, understanding what it means to speak responsibly is whether our system can explain why science has the right to say the things that it does. Based on the results of science. And how is this going to lead us to the what, is, what light is this going to throw on metaphysics? Which, remember, I claimed that in the end, that's what's most important, and it's important to Carnap for ethical reasons. What light is this whole project going to throw on that? Well, the thing is that um, the main point is the Aufbau is a demonstration that this may be possible, but the main point, the difference between us and the metaphysicians is that we've taken on the task of doing this, whereas the metaphysicians will refuse it. Well, the, the metaphysicians, if you say, you know, well, let's see how we could show your right to say these things about monads or whatever, based on empirical results of science, the metaphysicians will say, no, no, you're not understanding. What we're saying couldn't have any implications like that. So that's what I claimed about the Aufbau, and that's why I claimed that when, that from Carnap's point of view, when he has to abandon strict translation in favor of these looser kinds of logical connection between theories and the evidence for theories, it's not a big deal for him. The main point is that the responsible person is going to um, accept the task of um, showing what is responsible speech in terms of what's empirically available to us. And, um, and by, by doing that, we're going to um, show our right to exclude the sentences of people who refuse such tasks. Right, and so therefore, from Carnap's point of view, it doesn't matter that um, um, it doesn't matter that the translation, strictly speaking, is impossible, sentence by sentence, or whatever. What matters is that uh, we've taken on a task of showing our right to our statements in terms of the evidence we actually have. So, um, so this is the point at which I've, I've tried to show that Quine's attack on Carnap is really unfair. Um, that, Karn, that Quine is 
systematically ignoring Carnap's real motivation, sticking him with another motivation that was never his motivation, and then showing what Carnap knew, if not already at the time he wrote the Aufbau, pretty soon afterwards, that if that were your motivation, this project would be pointless. Um, so, um, and I think, you know, that's enough if I'm right. Now, I mean, there's certain questionable things about what I said, but in any case, if I'm right, that's enough to show that this paper, Epistemology Naturalized, doesn't literally show that the project of logical positivism was pointless by means of its actual argument. Um, but, um, but there is a real issue here. Now, I mean, um, I wouldn't say that the real issue constitutes a knockdown argument against Carnap either, but it's a serious, serious attack on Carnap. And to see what it is, um, I'm going to call attention to what Quine says about the protocol sentences debate. So if you look on page 85, Right, and hopefully when you read this, you were like, oh yeah, protocol census debate, I know about that. <laughs> so right around 1932, there was a debate about protocol Zetza, and uh, he summarizes what the debate was, not completely accurately, but well enough. And then at the end of the paragraph, well enough considering that he only has this one paragraph for the whole thing, right? At the end of the paragraph, the worst of it was that there seemed to be no objective way of settling the matter, no way of making real sense of the question. Now, uh, like, um, your first reaction to that maybe should be, that was the worst of it? I thought that was Carnap's conclusion. <laughs> Right? Carnap's conclusion was, so, like, so the question is, are the protocol senses the Carnap kind or the Norat kind? And even though at the beginning of the debate, the debate, Carnap seemed to think that this was a theoretical question to be addressed again by the methods of empirical science, right? He said, we still need more, more research on the nature of the given or whatever. By the end of the debate, Carnap says, this is not a theoretical question, it's a practical question. So there is no objective way of settling it. Remember, that's the whole issue about pseudo-theoretical questions, according to Carnap. They look like there should be one, some way of settling them, according to evidence, and ending the dispute, only because they've been misphrased as theoretical, whereas the actual question is a practical question. Which is better? And then, of course, it depends on what your purposes are, and... Um, some are better for some purposes and others are better for other purposes. But even if one of them is ultimately better for absolute purposes, that is, let's say, ethically better, that still doesn't mean that it's true or false. It just means it's good or something like that. Right? It's good advice. <laughs> um... So, so Carnap agrees with Quine that there's no objective way to settle this question in some sense. But I think if you want to understand what the real debate is, um, you should imagine Quine asking this. So, okay, Carnap, this question is, about, is really about which language you should choose. Should you choose this language with this kind of protocol sentences, or should you choose this kind of language with this kind of protocol sentences as your system language? And Quine's question to Carnap is going to be, okay, Carnap, how can I tell which one you chose?
And now, to be consistent, Carnap has to give empirical criteria by which you can tell which kind of language he's speaking. So you can think of it this way. He has to give um, a way of translating the sentences of his system language into Quine's language, whatever that may be, such that Quine can check to see what form they have. Are they Carnap protocol sentences? Are they Neurot protocol sentences? But now, um, let me write holism here again. You can see one of the deeper things that Quine is trying to do with holism. And actually, like the main uh, locus where he talks about that is in the, or at least, well, the locus classicus where he talks about that is in the title essay of that collection I was showing you, Ontological Relativity. Um, but he briefly makes the same case here. And the case is this, that um, if theoretical statements can't be translated one by one into empirical meaning, then that means that there's no right way of translating sentences from one language into sentences of another one by one either. Because, go back to imagining our linguist setup, right? Suppose I don't know this language. What am I gonna, how am I going to find out what the sentences mean? Well, I show the speakers various stimuli and I say, you know, and I, like, I guess I have to know how to ask a question or something. But I, I present them with various sentences of their language and see if they're willing to emit them the presence of this stimulus, this stimulus, whatever. And gradually I build up a theory of how to translate their language into mine. But for everything in their language that's not an observation statement, as Quine understands what that is, um, which I won't get into, but for everything in their language that's a theoretical statement, in other words, um, There isn't going to be, thanks to holism, some particular set of stimulations that will get them to accept it or not accept it. Right? So, I mean, let's say that the people who are speaking this unknown language, um, it's interesting that in this literature, I don't think Quine uses the term here, but a lot of times they're thought of as a savage tribe quote unquote, right? Like peop, like an uncontacted tribe, as we say. I mean, they could call us an uncontacted tribe too, right? But in any case, an uncontacted tribe whose language is not similar to any known language, and we just, this is the only way to learn what they mean. You could imagine that it's a case of space aliens. That would make it seem a little bit different because now these people may know more than us rather than less than us. In any case, uh, it doesn't affect Quine's argument in detail, but it's worth thinking about why he makes it one way and not the other. So, you know, suppose it is space aliens and let's suppose they believe the theory of general relativity or whatever. We want, you know, so we want to find out if, let's say we want to find out if one of the sentences they emit is the same as the field equations of general relativity or not. Well, we're just not going to be able to tell because all we can tell is whether their total theory agrees with all the evidence we're presenting them or not. We can't tell whether one of the statements they emit means the same thing as when we write out whatever the, the field equations, box G, mu, nu equals, or wherever it goes. All right. So, um, um, therefore, I can't tell which of those languages you chose, Carnegie. I can't tell if you're using the Carnap sentences or the Neurot sentences. Well, of course, in real life I can tell. Why? 
because we already have certain accepted procedures for translating from your language to my language. Including, if we speak the same language, we have the, and I forget what people call this, not the identity translation, but, oh, the, the, uh, homonymous translation. Anyway, where you translate every statement by, in one language into a, a you know, an identical statement in the other language. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, once we already have that agreement to understand each other that way, then I can tell which you chose. But um, that's just a matter of habit. Right? So, I mean, this brings us back to something pretty close to Hume and Goodman, I think. Um, but if you ignore that habit and think we have to do it rationally, um, then, yeah, there's no way I can tell, Carnap, if you're speaking the same English that I'm speaking, or if you're speaking a language that sounds like English, but really all the meanings of the terms have been changed in such a way that, um, you know, um, when, when it sounds like you're saying, I take Carnap sentences as protocol sentences, what you mean is, I take the Neurot sentences as, as protocol sentences. So if that's the case, and this is getting back to the same thing I said about Goodman, if that's the case, then Carnap's real motivations don't exist. Right? That is, because there is no empirical fact of the matter which language you've chosen, there is no task of learning how to choose the right language. And therefore, there is no thing that Carnap thinks we have to learn how to do by looking at what scientists do, right? There is no ethical handling or attitude, not handling. Uh, handling is action. Uh, haltung, sorry. There is no ethical haltung. Um, that, you know, manifests itself in choosing to speak responsibly because there is no way of telling whether you're speaking what he thinks of as responsibly or not. Um, and therefore, since Carnap's real motivations are not motivations at all, according to Klein, he does that thing that I said that Goodman was doing also. He gets Carnap to say the closest thing that makes any sense, <laughs> according to him, and then he attacks that. So the closest thing that makes any sense, according to him, to Carnap's project, is this project of trying to show that our physical language is theoretically innocent by translating into um, uh, experience language. But then he shows that that, although it makes sense, is impossible. Okay, are there questions about that so far? Comparisons to the Watchmen? Yeah, it was definitely a comic book or comic books before it was a movie. That's almost all I know about it. Also, that the movie starts in the Tulsa Massacre or something that was not in the comic book. All right, anyway. Okay, so getting back to anything at all relevant to the course. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, um, so that's my understanding of what actually has happened between um, Carnap and Quine. Now I want to say something about what Carnap mean, what Quine means by innocent here, and also 
how it com how what Klein is doing compares to what Goodman is trying to do. Um, so, um, so the thing about theoretical innocence sounds like Goodman. Um, Remember, Goodman said we're trying to um, get rid of suspect notions. Um, right? Things that our philosophical conscience rejects, unless they can be explained in terms of the ones that uh, maybe actually. Right, the Carnap says we want to. I mean, Quine says we want to show that our physical language is innocent by showing that we can get rid of, you know, the like parts of it that we suspect of being guilty, <laughs> showing that they're really innocent. Goodman says we want to show that our scientific language is acceptable by getting rid of what look like unacceptable notions. So it sound, it's pretty much, sounds like pretty much the same thing. However, I think the criteria are actually different. Now, I didn't get a chance to talk about this really in Goodman, but remember, he says, I can't tell you what all the unacceptable without explanation, what all the notions that are unacceptable without explanation, according to my conscience, have in common. But I think you could say, that what what they have in common is that they're kind of spooky, <laughs> right? You know, I guess that's why angels and devils are on the list. And that's why angels and devils would be compared to the other things that are on the list, like dispositional predicates, non-actual possibles, classes. Goodman is trying to suggest to you that just like angels and devils are kind of like, ooh, they're immaterial beings, who knows where they are, you can't see them, you can't touch them, whatever. That, you know, that's what's wrong, unacceptable about all these other things. Whereas Klein, I think, has a different. And here, spooky is not Goodman's terminology, but disorderly is Klein's terminology for what he doesn't want. So, um, even though what he doesn't want overlaps to a very great extent with Goodman. And in fact, that one of the things that Goodman and Quine worked on together was trying to figure out how much, how far classes could be eliminated from the language of mathematics. So um, I'm going to read to you from a different paper by Quine, another famous paper, but much earlier, 1948, called On What There Is. And in On, On What There Is, he imagines this philosopher he calls Wyman. So it's because the first philosopher is called Mick X. And so it's like X and Y. So the second one is Wyman. And Wyman is someone who believes in unactualized possibles. Remember, one of those things on Goodman's list of unacceptables. Wyman maintains, sorry, Pegasus, Wyman maintains, has his being as an unactualized possible. So, Pegas so Wyman is someone who believes in unactualized possibles and doesn't want to eliminate them. What's wrong with that? 
This is what Klein says. Wyman's overpopulated universe, right? It's overpopulated because he's admitted too many things into his ontology. Not only actuals, but unactualized possibles. Wyman's overpopulated universe is in many ways unlovely. It offends the aesthetic sense of us who have a taste for desert landscapes. But this is not the worst of it. Wyman's slum of possibles is a breeding ground for disorderly elements. And then he goes on to raise a whole bunch of difficult issues about identity and difference of unactualized possibles. Take, for instance, the possible fat man in that doorway, and again, the possible bald man in that doorway. Are they the same possible man or two possible men? How can we tell? Um, that is, um, the, these disorderly elements are elements that don't obey clear conditions of identity and difference. And therefore, we're going to get contradictions when we talk about them. And classes, too, although, as, as Quine says in, um, on what there is and elsewhere, um, at least they do have clear identity conditions. Um, they have other kinds of disorderly behavior, as we can see from the Russell paradox. So if we could, we would like to keep them out of our ontology. But what Quine says about this in various places, so, so Goodman wants to get rid of this spooky stuff in order to be like sensible and down to earth, I guess. Quine wants to get rid of this disorderly stuff because he's afraid that once we let it in, we'll get paradoxes. This actually, first of all, puts Quine a little bit closer to Carnap. Remember, that in a way is what Carnap is afraid of too. Antinomies, contradictions in the law. Um, um, but Quine doesn't think we can avoid it in Carnap's way. How can we avoid it? We have to actually um, avoid letting ourselves say that these disorderly elements exist. Um, But Quine admits, and there's like hints to that in on what there is, but there's a lot more said about it in his book, um, Word and Object, which was published in '62, maybe. Um, we are going to have to admit some of these risky elements into our ontology. We won't be able to keep the border of our desert landscape sealed quite as well as we would like because um, we need some of them to do some things we need to do in mathematics. Or at least we think we might and we haven't found a way to do without them yet. So, um, and we need mathematics for science. So this is what's known as the Quinean indispensability argument, <laughs> um, that certain elements have to be admitted to your ontology, even though they might live in slums and be disorderly. It's risky because we need their labor. Yeah, I hope you could hear something about the possible political connection between um, the possible connection between Carnap and Quine's disagreement about logic and epistemology and their political disagreements. Um, I guess don't have time to say anything more, um, except I will say one more thing, which is about this term naturalized in the title, epistemology naturalized. Why does the history of epistemology, according to Quine, go through 
these obscure British and American philosophers rather than through Kant um, or, uh, I mean, I also mentioned Mill, Mill, that's maybe a little bit of a problem, but rather than through Kant or Hegel or Nietzsche, well, um, um, we're trying to limit the number of philosophers we're going to have to naturalize into English. Limit it to Frege and Carnap, basically, because we need them. <laughs> Okay, um, there's a question about ontological Carnap as a socialist does not believe ontological slums should be permitted to exist if there are also ontological billionaires. <laughs> that would be great, great if I could find a way to make Carnap mean that. I can't think of one at the moment, but uh, I'll think about it. All right. Anyway, once again, I'm two minutes over. I'm sorry about that. And I will see you on Thursday. Bye.